Okay, guys, we're gonna start. A couple minutes late. Sorry for that. Um, so we're gonna look through the results of the quiz, and if we have any questions about the upcoming research paper, which is due on Thursday, um, we can tackle that. Remember that we're not meeting here on Thursday. We're meeting in the library. I should really find out where, where we check room out we're books. meeting. Yeah. yeah, let's let's meet where we check out books because the, even if I give you a room, the library is interesting because it's built on five levels, and you come in on what you think is the ground floor, but you turn out to be on level 300 or something. So it's always confusing to folks. And the lab where we actually do the orientation is like within 25 feet of the main checkout place. So let's meet at the main checkout place. It's a good idea. Okay. And, uh, and then we'll go to the actual room. Because uh, if I give you a room number, it's like third floor. I just walked in. I got to go up. But in fact, you're on the third floor. Legacy? I have a doctor's appointment on Thursday morning. Well, you're going to miss the, the great library orientation. I know. I'm uh, so sorry. Well, c'est la vie, as they say. Yeah. Um, Doctor comes first, got to take care of yourself, so that's it. Uh, but hopefully as many people uh, you know, can make it as are uh, you know, available and interested, given that it's not an obligatory day, you don't have to be there. It wasn't one of the um, mandatory attendance days. So let's see. So uh, and then in the order of things, there is a chapter for this week with a discussion. Just never stops. Uh, so this week we're working on um, uh, mobile technology and some of the things that that has given us in our media lives. And so there is a discussion. And for those of you who want to think about it and fill it in for extra credit, you can do that today. Um, I don't think there'll be an opportunity on Thursday. Uh, or you can do it online as usual. I look forward to seeing that. So a whole bunch of stuff. And you may just want to focus on your essay till Thursday. And then, you know, in the aftermath, give us your thoughts about personal media online. That's what I would do, frankly. Uh, because the research paper is worth 100 points, which is, you know, uh, four times as much as the quiz that we just did. And it's basically 20% of your grade. So, um, uh, you know, th the main thing is like, Maybe it doesn't need to be perfect, but it just needs to be in. You know, uh, that's what I've been struggling with is, is people not turning it in. And it's worth such a big part of your grade that um, it really, you know, uh, makes it hard to just succeed in a class if you don't, you don't turn it in. Now, uh, remember that uh, it's not due uh, the morning of the 28th, um, although it probably still says that. But we're going to make accommodation for the fact that we're going to go over to the library and the librarian will help us get our references all in order there. So if you have, you know, the opportunity to, to bring it with you, or I don't know if it's in Google Docs, or if it's uh, on a flash drive, or who knows how you're going to have it, or if you have, you know, write in your uh, corrections to your uh, uh, bibliography in pen or pencil, that's okay too. It's just, we, you will have that opportunity uh, on, uh, on Thursday to do that, which is great, because uh, that'll, you know, there won't be any problems with citation or stuff. We'll fix it all on Thursday. So I'd be expecting to see the essay, you know, like Thursday night, Friday morning, that's fine. As long as I can start getting to it on the weekend, that'd be good, okay? So it's not like, oh, 1010, it's not in on Thursday. That's Give yourself, you know, we'll, we'll give you time to do the library uh, uh, orientation and, and then fix it up. And the citations are APA? Uh, APA for anything other than the textbook. And then the textbook itself is simply uh, author's name and page number in the body text of the essay is fine. Okay. Yeah. So anything, anything outside of that APA. And Wendy, will, uh, our librarian, will help us with that. Okay. If we need help. Um, gotcha. I'm hearing lots of chat noises, maybe. Uh, hey, Kibway. Kibway's joining us. First time streaming. Welcome to the streaming game. OK. Uh, right, so well, let's get in and take a look at this quiz, which uh, there were, you know, there's a couple of little signs in there that um, 
that suggests to me that some of the questions, or you know, at least one or two of them, were probably a little confusing or something. So we can look at that. Um, so my view of when we look at the at quiz results is uh, is not just to like fill you in on the right answers, but it's also let's you know let's Q and A the the quiz. Let's see if there's something wrong with it or something. So. Uh, so I'm open to uh, uh, discussing the validity of, uh, of some questions, especially if everyone got the same one wrong. That's usually a sign to me that uh, something wrong with that question, not wrong with eight people or 10 people or something. You know. Julian. Thank you. There you go. All righty. Uh, so, so let's take a look. Um, here, it'll, I'll give you a blank one. I, I know you did yours online due to. Um, something you couldn't come into class for. So here you can look at these questions just to follow along. All right, here we go. So let's take a look here. Uh, so the first question, convergence refers to the blurring of boundaries between different types of electronic communication. So that's true. You know, convergence is things that used to be separate coming together. You know, and it's interesting this week we're talking about mobile devices because that's really technologically where convergence has really entered our lives in a big way. You know, phone calls, text messages, emails, videos, audio, podcasts. You know, even radio legacy has taught me <coughs> can all be had in one device now. So that uh, used to need a separate box for every one of them. So that's a that's a big change, and that's what you know a great a great uh, um, indication of convergence. Um, all right, the next one, and, and you know, it's all of this comes back to digitization, right? The the possibility for all media coming together in one mobile device. It's Clearly connected to digitization, but also just you know, in um, Rick and Legacy and CJ have, have been and Fenris and others have been in this BCST 119 class um, that um, um, I'm teaching, and you know, it's uh, one of the things you see there is that just you know everything gets eventually converted down to ones and zeros, you know. An image is broken up into pixels, and then each pixel is described in ones and zeros. You know, an audio file we'll see is gets broken down into you know voltages, positive or negative, and each sample of that is converted to ones and zeros. And so, you know, in a very significant way, everything engineers have found a way to you know to to reduce everything to ones and zeros, and then that can stream over a network to your device, and then your apps can sort out like what's an image, what's audio, what's video from all that. So convergence in a, in a fundamental way depends on that you know, digitization, figuring out how to make everything ones and zeros. It's pretty, pretty amazing. All right, anyway, uh, I won't expound on every question like that. Sorry, get philosophical in the morning. So. So number two, localism is increasingly irrelevant to broadcast radio stations. So that's false. It's one of the things that they can compete on is localism, uh, one of the few things. Uh, whose model of communication is known as the mathematical model? So that's a pure memory question, and it's Shannon and Weaver. And number four, what do you call messages that are received almost instantaneously after transmission? So those are, that's synchronous, right? Um. And please uh, stick a hand up with any question. Is, you know, these are these are not the ones that people were getting uh, problems with. Which kind of an effect is it when we learn from the mass media? Cognitive effect. All right. All right. The next one up. David Sarnoff's radio music box memo described a way to make money from broadcast radio. So that is true. Uh, you know, Sarnoff's proposition was that. Uh, Radio could support itself by becoming a source of music and entertainment in the home. So it was a business proposition. And number seven, airing radio newscasts was so controversial that it led to newspaper press radio war settled by the Biltmore Agreement, which placed a number of limitations on radio news. So that is true. They went to the Biltmore Hotel. Broadcasters and newspaper publishers sat down together. And one of the limitations they put on radio news was that radio news should wait until after the evening edition of the newspapers had you know, hit the stands. 
before they broke any news which would compete with that. So it was kind of like uh, uh, establishing a, a news window, let's say, for, uh, for broadcasting. Imagine what they would have made of the internet. It's like everybody racing at the last split second, you know, to get, to, to post the news. All right, number eight, radio stations profited during World War II in part because advertisers weren't able to buy as much newspaper advertising as desired, so they bought radio advertising instead, so that's true. Um, there wasn't enough newsprint to go around, so radio profited from that. All right, who performed the first practical demonstration of wireless transmission of signals? Uh, so if you got this wrong, I would love to give you a point for this. Because basically, uh, what is um, uh, unclear about this question is, is it wireless transmission of a radio signal, in which case Marconi is our guy? Or is it wireless transmission of any kind of signal, in which case Heinrich Hertz demonstrated you know, the existence of the electromagnetic spectrum when it was jumping. So unless you put Fessenden or Morse, Morse was clearly wrong because he wasn't wireless, he was wired. He was the telegraph guy, right? So, but Marconi or Hertz were valid answers. And so if, if you got either one of those, if you got either one of those, I'll give you a point. Kira? Online, it said I got the question wrong. I put down Hertz. Oh, you put down Hertz? OK. I got it wrong. All right, so we can correct that. That is why we are here. <laughs> All right, so let me make a note to give you a point for that. Are you able to look at your actual answers, Kira? Yeah, I was able to look at I mean, now. Just, oh, right, just right now? Yeah. I mean, maybe I bet. Or you're just like, going by memory? Yeah. OK, well. That one bothered me the most. Okay. I was like, I know this. I didn't want to bother you. So, so you know, write down a list of stuff that you know that you may want to check this afterwards. All I'm saying is that you know, if there's others that that are debatable or whatever. I, okay. Yeah. yeah. All righty. But uh, you know, again, I think well, let's move on. Number ten, what we today refer to as a network was called something else. It was chain broadcasting. Okay. Uh, next one, a little tricky. Who was associated with the development of television? In fact, all of these people were, not just. So Philo T. Farnsworth actually is the guy who's, you know, the creator of television. But as we saw, Zwerkin was right next to him. And Logie Baird had a television system in the early days. So all of these people were involved in it. Uh, number 12, just as with radio, early television was dominated by networks. That's certainly true. Um, you know, no more need be said. Television made its first public debut in 1939 at the New York World's Fair. That's also true. Uh, 14, broadcast affiliates are independent stations without network associations. So that's tricky because broadcast affiliates do have network associations. That's what makes them affiliates. So they have that affiliate relationship. Number 15, carriage rules. Uh, the answer is A, required cable systems to carry signals from significantly viewed local stations. So remember the logic of that was the FCC thinking, oh boy, if cable could bring an ABC affiliate from any part of the country into your local network because it was cheaper, then that would cut out those local stations which you know, have been licensed and they're, they're a business. So we don't want that to happen. So, uh, part of the rule is what they call the must-carry rule. Uh, the, uh, the, the, local, uh, the local stations must be carried by the cable operators. Number 16, which of the following statements is true? Uh, okay, so this one is another, uh, something I'll definitely entertain uh, objections to. So the FC, you know, one good answer is the FCC treats subscription-based media differently than broadcast media. And that, you know, to me is the best answer. However, in looking through what people were answering, and uh, a lot of people went for all of the above. So I would also give you a point for all of the above. So let me explain, not too long, I hope, what's up with this question. Uh, so the FCC definitely treats subscription-based media different than broadcast media. Uh, this is, for instance, why you'll see plenty of TNA and more violence in HBO shows or other premium cable shows than you'll see in broadcast television. 
uh, because uh, the FCC is mandated to monitor content and keep offensive content off the airwaves, but not off of cable systems. So the logic there is if you, you know, subscribe to a cable system, then it's up to you. You don't like it, you unsubscribe if you're offended by the content, right? But given that the airwaves are out there as, you know, part of the air, the public good, uh, the FCC has a mandate to make sure that, you know, nothing too offensive hits those airwaves. And so that's, that's why they still uh, uh, look on uh, uh, broadcast media as different from subscription media, like cable TV, if you want. All right. Now, as we go on, so this is where uh, the other ones are less good, but I could see how they would mislead you. So B, the Internet has full First Amendment protection. True. However, there are exceptions to that as regards obscenity. So everybody is you know, aware that child pornography on the internet uh, is, results in arrests and you know, uh, significant policing. So it's not like everything goes on the internet. So that might you know, uh, uh, mislead you. However, on the whole, First Amendment protection is, uh, on, covers the internet as well. And finally, the fairness doctrine is no longer in place. Uh, so this is like really, a, the wording is difficult because the fairness doctrine, to go back to the, uh, uh, the original intent of the, the doctrine, uh, which you know, for a long time was enforced. <coughs> the idea that um, when political views are aired on broadcast media, there should be a balance and there should be an immediate balance for fair representation of different points of view. And given the political, you know, binarism of our country here, where we got Democrats and Republicans, uh, pretty much it was, you know, either a Democrat or a Republican politician. If one spoke, the other had to speak immediately afterwards and have equal time to speak. Uh, it also was enforced in terms of editorial content in news shows, like 60 Minutes. I remember watching it with my parents. They had a, a segment called point counterpoint where a conservative would say something and then the counterpoint built into the you know into the segment they had a liberal on to talk as well and you know if you watch the news hour or something or listen to it you still have you know David Brooks noted conservative and Mark Shields noted liberal who face off however since the 1980s the fairness doctrine although it is still extant it's still on the books it's not enforced anymore uh, the idea was simply that um, with so many cable channels, with so much media, we no longer have to worry that one side will be better represented than another. Uh, you know, the audience will cultivate those outlets that uh, present the points of view they need to hear. So uh, this gives rise to Rush Limbaugh, to Fox News, to heavily partisan media. You can see that the fairness doctrine would really uh, you know, keep that under control if it was enforced because Fox would have to have legitimate, uh, you know, liberals on and vice versa. So, uh, but they, they stopped enforcing it. So finally, the fairness doctrine is in place, but it's no longer enforced. So what do we do with that? So did anybody get 16 wrong? I think I got that one wrong too. Okay, so we'll take that. I, you know, it's the, I'll look at it. Yeah, so I, I tried accessing it just now, but it won't let me view it because yeah. it won't let you do it once. Well, you can look at it afterwards and, you know, mark this stuff to your, you know. Yeah, um, I put like stars next yeah, to the good. that I would like for okay. you to review. And then, e well, you review what you answered and then email me. Or actually, no, I can get into the quiz too. Yeah, it, so it, that's cool. it, it, it like, won't let me view my answers sure. anymore. Okay. So I can't see it, but like, if, if you could like go back and I will. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's easy for me to do. It's true as the as the administrator. Okay, well, I know that was long. So, 17 FM radio, which provides superior signal quality, rapidly overtook AM radio. So that's false. Remember, FM radio was created in the 30s, and there was a long, you know, battle between Armstrong and Sarnoff, which resulted in Armstrong's suicide, and really FM didn't become a force until the mid 60s and early 70s. Uh, there were FM stations, but a lot of them just repeated what was on AM. You 
know, it was kind of like an afterthought. Oh yeah, we got this license, let's just rebroadcast what's going on AM. But, you know, with high fidelity, with people listening to music in stereo, then FM found its place for sure. Uh, 61, uh, sorry, in, uh, question number 18. The answer is a vast wasteland. That's what Newton Minow said about uh, TV. Uh, number 19, since the late 50s, radio stations have typically established an identifying format. So this is the idea that you know, stations starting with easy listening and then with the many formats we have nowadays, that's how they differentiate. Number 20, what does it mean when programs such as game shows are stripped into the television schedule? So that would be C, they are aired five days a week in the same time slot. So that would mean, hey Mike, that would mean every night uh, at 11 you get an episode of a rerun like Frasier or something like that. I'm gonna, should we, should we put this desk for you, Mike? All right. Okay. Just looking at these pamphlets, I am reminded that uh, I think today is the deadline to apply for a certificate if you have enough Oh, okay. Credits to get one of our certificates already, so uh, you should fill in the paper and actually apply for it. So end of the list, second month. Uh, I don't. Semester. It's yeah. It's the, there's, there's just a limit time, and so at that point, like if you if you miss this deadline, you can apply for your to get your certificate or degree during the summer session or the oh, yeah. fall session, right? It's just, it's just yeah. if you want it at the end of the spring session, you summer have to tell them away. enough in advance so they can prepare it all for you. And for some people, you know, that's it's important. They want to walk the stage and have that now, and I understand that. So just a heads up. OK. Uh, we're on to number 21. Mike, we're looking over the answers to the quiz. We've already been a fair bit through. But if you want to talk before 119, we can also we can take a look quickly that way. 21, it would be safe to say that in the 50s, radio was saved by rock and roll. Uh, which of the following best describes ESPN? It's a cable network. Uh, what programming strategy is being used when a network programs four situation comedies into a two hour period? So that means like a Sunday night animation, and they call that blocking. You create blocks of similar programs for sitcoms or for animated shows. If a network schedules a new or weak program between two strong programs, so here's the image. You got two strong programs and a weak program in the middle of it. So it looks like a hammock. So that is hammocking. And then when a network goes directly from one program to another program without a commercial break, this is an example of bridging. So the idea is create a bridge between one show and another. Okay. So I know that I'm looking at Kira's online exam. Change it, looking at those couple questions. There's, is there anybody else? Any, any debatable questions we should look at that have up to you now. Right. I Philo T. Farnsworth for the Philo. Yeah. yeah, okay. So he was one, but not yeah. not all of the people involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which one was that? That was uh Number 11, Mike. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, okay, I'll give you, I'm still looking over questions and such, but uh, uh, for those who have finished looking over the questions, just, you know, my question to you is we're going to have the midterm exam coming up. Uh, it's going to be quite similar, and I usually would review and prepare for it in a similar way. Is there something we can do different? that you know, other classes do better or things that would help you um, 
do better on these quizzes. So a reminder of how we reviewed for this one is we have the cahoots, which have a lot of similar, if not identical, questions. So we practice on those. Those are super uh, helpful. Yeah, OK. And we also, uh, you know, I prepare a little video of the PowerPoints. And I highlight in red the, you know, the important uh, information on the PowerPoints. Uh, because those PowerPoints are really huge. When you got four chapters, we're talking about you know like 50 slides with you know 10 points on each slide. So, uh, uh, so if we are, yeah. So where is the? It's in the review document, and so where is that? Six. Darn thing. It's in six. Here's one review. Yeah. So there they go. Thank you. So these are, uh, yeah, I, I don't put them up as PowerPoints because they actually belong to the textbook publisher, and I don't think they would like just to have them distributed and stuff. But, so I make a little video that you can pause, but you know, like the question is like, uh, this is the mathematical model. So Shannon Weaver. So I highlight in red this, you know, the the information that's important to remind yourself of. Again, you know. I asked, uh, you know, if you're learning something, it's a cognitive effect. We asked about synchronous communication. Uh, we first question was regarding convergence. You know, so admittedly, okay, that one, you know, I vary the questions, so that one wasn't on this one. All of these guys and were, you know, we we'll pose questions about these two anyway. Um, you know, so so. There's, there's, again, there's more here because the way I set up the quiz is, uh, you know, with I, the questions are not always the same, basically, because we review them online and stuff. So. You say it's not a PDF, Chris? probably. Um, uh, no, it's not a PDF. It's like a little video that plays okay. out. Yeah. Is the midterm multiple choice as well? Is there going to be same a little types bit of, of Same types of questions. Okay. There's definitely no short answers or essays on yeah. it. It's all okay. true, false, multiple Just curious. choice. Yeah. Yeah. There was, I think there's 50 questions on it, so 25. Yeah. Uh, was that just your, your question? Was yeah. So it's like bigger, and, uh, and again, some of these questions may come back because it's all kind of randomized and stuff. So it, you know, it'll it'll spit out something, and, uh, but we'll 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 cover in the review everything that it could possibly be. So the midterms do cover four four chapter or more. More, yeah, because the quiz was just the four chapters, yeah, and, so, and we're adding a couple more on, I guess. Um, is uh, I just want to see is possible that the review sheet is up there already for I don't know if I made it available. So so that's so. Um, however, to stick to my topic, is there anything we could do better regarding review and? Preparation for for quiz or exam. No. I think you do a good job. Thank you, thank you. But it, there are, there are always you know teachers do other stuff too. It's, this is this is a type of course with a lot of like little factual information. It's, it's not something you can reason through the exam and figure out. Uh, it's like it's more it's more like just you know kind of like okay yeah. who did this who did that so. Yeah, CJ? Is there like a way to condense all the cahoots into one? So we can have them like all in like. I don't. Know. It's a good question. I could find out, but I don't think there is. Um, it, yeah, you know, there's, there's already just. Well, yeah, I don't think there is, but I can find out. Okay. Yeah. Because that would be easier just to go through it all without having to jump. OK, well, if you can think of something, or if you want to just tell me one on one, that, that's fine, too. That's, that would be super helpful. Um, and I'm just looking ahead. So the midterm exam review is there. So our midterm's on March 14th. Uh, everyone should come in for that. And let's just look at the review sheet. Uh, yeah, OK. However, these challenges are going to be out of date. So these are from last semester. I have to renew them. So it looks like seven chapters with Kahoot challenges. And um, so 
And again, the other thing is, you know, on the Tuesday we'll review, so on the Thursday then we'll have the exam. Uh, and I will try to get to updating those challenges uh, well, well in advance, right? So that takes us, so next week we have one more week of content and then the week after is midterm, um, midterm season. <clears throat> I wish you all good luck. And I know there's, there's like essays coming in all together, like sometimes you have three, four things at once. I feel for you. Um, what I try to do is give, it, give the assignments enough in advance so if you could maybe space it out if you. Um, okay, so um, mobile, yeah, mobile and the, the changes that it has wrought on, uh, on broadcasting. Uh, it's just one more thing, okay, <laughs> sorry. Next week we're talking about advertising. So again, a brief history of advertising and then trying to update to capture you know, some of the later information about targeted advertising as it's going on. Uh, in our discussion next week, um, you know, I ask you to talk about you know, advertisements and how much are around you. So uh, this is just a little heads up here, uh, advertising awareness exercise for next week. It's just um, uh, try to be more aware than usual of the ads that are out there and if you watch the Super Bowl that would be you know that's a great showcase for usually ads that have a lot of um, effort pumped into them so just uh, try to try to be a little more aware of advertising around you in, in this last week so that you'll have um, you know more to talk about next week basically. We talked a lot about the Hofka do we? I, I looked a little bit at it. I don't remember a lot of advertising, I guess. I don't know. The Oscars itself was a weird thing, but I always find it strange. Um, they've been losing ratings in the last... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. PowerPoint summaries. Um, just looking also at some of the stuff that's up here. The... Um, this PDF, although it's not from our textbook, uh, is a very interesting, you know, it's, it's uh, prepared by Qualcomm, the chip manufacturer. <coughs> they make a lot of, excuse me, a lot of chips for cell phones. Um, but it's, uh, it's actually a very interesting, well, it's, it's probably easier if I download it just to look at it. Something. Before, before we dive into the history and some of, you know, how we got to where we are, it's just um, also good to I, um, see a little where we are. Yes, Mike? Just maybe stupid, but uh, it's June 14, right? June 14th? We are 19 now, so, you know. This oh, I see what you mean, yeah. Well, this takes us this takes us through to 4G LTE, which is the current commercialized technology, but... That's what um, we have here. Have you guys been following, uh, you know, the Huawei scare and the... Uh, pardon me? 10 times faster than 4G. Oh, the 5G. Oh, yes. Uh, but wh where, I've, where I've been seeing it talked about a great deal is that, um, yeah. uh, for instance, the, the uh, chief, financial of, op, op, uh, chief financial officer of Huawei, who is the daughter, apparently, of the founder of the company, uh, was arrested when she went through Canada, and uh, she's um, uh, still being held there. She was arrested at the request of the United States, uh, which uh, accused Huawei of violating some sanctions. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Trump then, of course, went on and said, uh, is uh, you know said well she'd also be a great bargaining chip in this negotiation yeah, I mean, and I'm having with China right <laughs> well yeah it's kind of like the guy cannot play cards close to his chest for sure but he's called Canadian <laughs> <laughs> well well now yeah the, there's a the, China has arrested some Canadians and we wonder if Canada has the guts to actually uh, extradite um, uh, 
the, uh, the, the, uh, the chief financial officer of Huawei. We'll see. Uh, so, so um, you know. It's atomic. At issue is not just the speeds in 5G, uh, but also the domination of that, you know, uh, that technology and, uh, and the security concerns, which the United States has about whether people's data, you know, whether government data or, or will be secure within that network. And you know, uh, I also there's an enormous economic advantage to uh, to controlling this technology, and the United States uh, up until now has been the controlling party. Uh, but it looks like um, you know, 5G is going to be different, probably. Yeah, Verizon has 5G. Uh, do they are they actually marketing it? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Uh, there was a there was a report I saw on the internet. They actually local United States consumer has it. It's like 1.05 than 4G. Wow. And I think if I will make a big statement, AT T AT and T is the one is to be blamed because they did not invest enough to catch up. Oh, okay. Now it's more back on the government. Anyway, that's too political. Well, whatever they do, I don't know. It's the money and power control you right? It is very political, all of this, but you know, the other thing is my I'm sure that they'll they'll uh, just soak subscribers for more money to pay for whatever needs to be done. Everyone will want this in terms of speed. Uh, you know, the so when talking about 5G, the other thing is this is going to be the standard not just for uh, you know, more rapid data, but also the Internet of Things, um, which uh, apparently can use a lot of the same protocols that exist already, but to get your fridge talking to Amazon to tell them what's missing and things like that. So uh, this is going to be, you know, potentially a much, much bigger use of networks than we've ever had before. Um, so 5G has to be very fast and efficient. Uh, and it's going to be in everything, and you know everything <laughs> seems to be produced in China. Uh, so it's you know there's there's a, there's something important about that I think. Uh, so this document, although it's it's uh, kind of long and uh, um, it, it it explains it explains uh, the development of the different G's, which is a lot of people say or ask, and, and rightly so. It's like, well, you know, what's the difference between all these G's? And uh, it, so G stands for generation, and uh, we have, you know, continuously been upgrading uh, the, the standards for mobile connectivity. Um, so, you know, Early 1G mobile, first generation mobile technology was analog voice. So that meant that when you made a call, it basically tied up a complete channel. Uh, it wasn't packet switched. Uh, so those are those gigantic, you know, brick-like cell phones that only, you know, really, yeah, really rich people had in their phones or something. Yeah, but it was, and it was, you know, basically every channel in the network would be tied up with, you know, a single call, uh, and then when you get into 2G, you actually get into digital packet switched, which means that the network can carry voice and data as well. But uh, you notice the speeds, uh, you know, 0.5 megabits per second, really not fast. Um, and these are not exponents, these are just footnotes there, basically. So as you, as you move through the development, uh, you know, uh, GSM, well, there's, there's been a couple of globally competitive systems, ev even under 2G, GSM or CDMA. So CDMA, for instance, would have been Verizon standard. GSM would have been an early AT&T standard. And those have developed out in 3G and 4G. And in terms of what the user sees is just faster speeds, which allow video and audio when you get to the 3G, and uh, also, you know, uh, more applications for data, basically. More data services along with your phone calls and such. So uh, 3G is uh, where, where data actually becomes, you know, useful. Uh, and then 4G, obviously a lot faster, and uh, um, 
you know, more efficient, so providing more connectivity to different devices and stuff. And then 4G LTE, these are refinements of the standards which provide faster speed. And you see that sometimes on some networks you can't get LTE, uh, it, or in some places you can't necessarily get LTE, uh, and you fall back on slower speed 4G. But, um, Did iPhones like start off with 3G, right? Like, like the first iPhone. Was iPhone 2G? Yeah. yeah it, was 2G. it was really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. I forgot. Okay. I didn't even know. Which is like a step back because like my first cell phone was like a Nokia or whatever. But it had 3G. Oh, interesting. So it had just come out. CJ? So is like 5G like a real thing now? Like it exists. Oh yeah, it exists. Yeah, like yeah right. The first it it okay. exists. It's 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 at the stage where you know people have to uh, companies have to invest in the switching technology. Isn't that mainly I went, China? Like I went to Asia over the summer and I bought like a like a five G SIM card mm. and it was faster than like a than like my American SIM card for Verizon. Well, cool. I wasn't sure if it was actually five G because like it was like I don't, I don't know it was like Asia so I was like skeptical about it. <laughs> But like, yeah. it was like really faster than my actual phone. And I only paid like less than $5 for 16 gigs a day. Wow. And it was like, man. Hey, CJ. It was like, I was like, fun. <laughs> CJ, just for information, in Japan and Asia, they have 8K TV now with yeah. to 4K. And my friend comes from Japan, Taiwan, but the phone is a year ahead of us. I'm talking about four years ago. Yeah. I used to be scared of what I eat about Asia. Now I open myself when I check the YouTube. I'll be Chinese and compare the information. I know how actually we're behind now. It's scary. I understand why the government do that, but I say pay me AT and T because you don't invest. Mm -hmm. What about yeah. freeway? Look at how long we take to pay pay bridge? Ten years. <laughs> so you see a general a general a general slowing down of the engine of the American uh, uh, innovation and economy. Yeah. Go to high speed, right? Don't, yeah. I just said it, you know. So I, you know, I, you're not 15 years behind. These are my personal feelings as well, but uh, you know, I may, I can't, I can't base it on comprehensive data. I read the newspaper like everybody else, and I see signs, but I don't know, I don't know what to say about it. Um, but Kira, you were saying, you were saying it's Chinese. But, Isn't that mainly in China? I mean, it's 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 where it's, where it's being developed, and, yeah, and the and the yeah. It's in UK now. It's in New Zealand. And, uh, in, in terms of the deployment, yeah. deployment to the consumer. Yeah. Yeah. Are they they testing the system? Okay. The number two, one number two largest provider in the country. Got it. They check the mark. Even UK uh -huh. would be backing up USA. Uh -huh. But they can afford. I think they can afford to lose the timing of getting behind compared to other countries. Yeah. So they have to overcome the political agenda. Yeah. Again, in the in the news that I've been reading, it talks about uh, U.S. trade representatives putting uh, pressure on NATO countries, for instance, like Poland and Czechoslovakia, not to uh, use the the Chinese, the Huawei 5G uh, uh, devices, basically, because you know the technology uh, is a standard, right? Uh, but uh, whoever builds the the hardware that makes it and software that makes it work <clears throat> doesn't necessarily necessarily have to be one country or another. It just Apparently, Huawei and the Chinese are much further ahead on it than American companies. Uh, concern. Um, How does this relate to our subject? Um, well, the subject of the week is mobile technology. So uh, the first thing I think I've I've found people asking about. Uh, is, you know, um, what are these G's and what's the point of these G's? Especially nowadays, uh, in the last few weeks, I hear nothing but, uh, you know, 5G, danger to U.S. security and so on and so forth. So, so this, I know this is a 40-page document. A lot of it is sort of infographics and stuff. Uh, it's not on the exam because, you know, what's on the exam covers the textbook and stuff. But for your information, I, it's just very interesting to see, you know, what has developed with the generations of technology as, as it goes on. You know, so uh, there. I mean, it's it's okay. We we will go to our powerpoints instead of uh, instead of dwelling on that PDF. But it's there, and I, I think uh, if you're interested in this, it's it's still valid even if made in 2014. But uh, there's, oh, yeah. you're going to be filling in 5G um, 
on, on you know, through your own. Way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Or I can I can find some you know some some websites and stuff. I can Google just like you guys. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Hate to say it, but uh, and then the new tech the new the new edition of the of the uh, of the um, textbook is due uh, apparently over the summer. So we'll see oh. an, uh, we'll see an updated textbook hopefully with more about this. All right, so. Um, we promised we promised a little history, and uh, uh, wow. so uh, right. Yeah. Who would have thought that a cell phone was available in 1947? Uh, but that that was an idea. Um, what do we got up here? Uh, I don't want to try to review the the history of the landline telephone. Um, <laughs> Let's jump in around personal digital assistance because some of us may remember that. Mike, did you have a did you have a Newton or a Palm Pilot or some kind of my, PDA? My, my boss has one. She's very into texting and file. She's a director. Uh -huh. Look, it's like I have my first cell phone available in San Francisco. Look at it, like that's tiny, tiny for the type. Uh, uh, COC is typing information. And it's more functional for business executives, yeah. but there's a wide laptop processing, more way to do Got it. Yeah. I, get to, I look at it, it's not for me. Well, the PDA would not have uh, combined the, the telephone function just yet. The idea was it was kind of like a, a, a digital, you know, little notebook that you would carry around with you. Blueberry, right? Uh, BlackBerry is a uh, is is a phone with a mechanical keyboard and and uh, text apps in it, um, which was really popular in the corporate world. Um, but uh, the Apple Newton yeah, is <laughs> yeah. I want I want you guys to look just at this marketing video from yeah, the <laughs> from the era. Oh, it's probably actually linked in here uh, because it's. Where have I got here? Have I got some videos? Well, let's just get to it here. Uh, it's, it's really surprising. It's Sir Isaac Newton. <laughs> That's incredible. Let's go PDA. Yeah. There's kind of an infomercial about it. In a way, not by Apple, in a small way. Not the Blackberry? There we go. The same, maybe. Not the car, It's really ugly. This is actual. Newton's about a lot of things, really. I think the part that excites me the most has to do with helping people keep in touch. The idea behind Newton is that it's an assistant, something that actively helps you as you capture, organize, and communicate your ideas and information. The possibilities are just limitless. When you think about it, the most natural way to get your thoughts down is to jot or to sketch. We wanted Newton to be that natural. Say you're on a train or a plane or at a little cafe. You can write a fax. Say you want to send that fax to Margaret. You just highlight Margaret's name in the text, tap fax. And Newton will automatically fill out a fax cover sheet with Margaret's number on it. We've built in Newton intelligence so that Newton knows enough about what you're trying to do to help you do it. The beauty of Newton is that any page you have in your Newton can be sent through email. Text, graphics, pages from your calendar, business cards. You just select email and, well, you send it. Simple as that. It seems to happen all the time these days. You're expecting a really important message, but you can't guarantee you're going to be easy to reach. By just getting the Newton messaging card, you can get your message wherever you go. <laughs> you can share anything that's in your Newton with anyone else. Using Newton's built-in infrared networking capability, you can beam things to other people. It's pretty handy in meetings to just be able to send someone something instantly. Your business card, or the notes, or a calendar page. You can even jot notes to jog your memory later, or set an alarm. Or add a task to your to-do list. Kind of a communication center. Play no. long bowling. <laughs> Inbox and outbox. The Newton Connection Kit lets you connect your Newton to your PC or your Macintosh and share and store information. This is all about being in charge of your life. 
being able to have information so you can keep in touch with people. It's going to help you keep track of your time and your contacts, but it's going to do it in a way that's not intrusive to your lifestyle. I'd say that Newton is really peace of mind, right in the palm of your hand. Wow. Big and ugly. And no, 15 years ago, okay? Uh, so, so what do you think? What do you think? Like, look at that. No, no, okay, so that's like the first Palm Pilot. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's the original. They lost it to Apple. <laughs> the original PDA, yeah. So, but it's, yeah, legacy. Yeah. So future phones, like now generation, that have like styluses attached and built into them, they're like incorporated from Newton, basically. There's a, there's a basic set of ideas there that, you know, a lot of them are really well implemented in our phones. And there you got a stylus as well. Yeah. It allows me to write notes and like... And it does yeah. character yeah. recognition. It's, you, awesome. It'll turn it into text and stuff. Yeah, I can yeah. That. There, there you go. So, I mean, uh, so what do you think about this? I mean, it's funny because it's big and clunky, right? Yeah, but that's the first generation. Yeah. You expect it to be like, you know... It was innovative and... It, it, great ideas, maybe just the execution wasn't great, Julia. The commercial is just like it's like I see I see where I see where Apple gets a lot of their ideas for like commercials yeah. nowadays because it's like oh, you can have everything in the palm of your hand. Yeah. And it's super accessible. People of all different ages and colors and different uh, job background, like you know different job markets. It's like yeah, everybody yeah. can use it and everybody can have it. So it's like I mean if you can pay for it, but like, yeah. But like you know. The commercial, I'm like, because I think a lot about how Apple brand stuff now with their commercials is like a lot of bright colors and a lot of things popping out, things that look sleek and kind of sexy. So oh, it's, yeah. Or like, you know, just having attractive people like in the commercials makes me want to buy it. So it's like, that was the first thing I noticed. And then um, I think, yeah, that was just the first thing I noticed. And I was like, oh, wow, this is like, this is like what's going on today still. Yeah. Yeah. And like taking things and going out in the world with them more specifically. Yeah, yeah. So you're, I mean, I'll call it an ideology. I know that's a little bit of a strange term, but it's kind of the ideology of control your life because you control, you know, your communication better. And, and you know, it, it kind of speaks to a consumer need, which is groomed in that type of advertising, which is, oh, there's too much data, or you want to get ahead in your career by, you know, having all of this at your fingertips. And, and that really hasn't changed, I think. That's... That's a strong, you know, idea that's still in a lot of these messages. I think they have the opportunity being the first one, but the way that the up, the way they're so slow in upgrade to one more choice, the color, the style, give Apple a chance. And I, I read the report back then. Blackberry seemed to have a hard time to branch out the market share. They only made to 15, 20 percent for a specific group. Yeah. So I guess that might be why they were in the law of the market and yeah. had to close the company. They bought by another company, by. Yeah, the limitation of their market share was mostly as they were a computer yeah. company, but as they branched out into System. other media with, uh, you know, iTunes and then the iPhone kind of broke that open, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they got a huge market share of the... So they used they owned yeah. by Apple or not? Pardon me? They were not owned by Apple originally, right? What we just watched? No, I mean the bad family. Black Blackberry, no, it's a Canadian company, actually. Yeah, it was like, and that, that means that the Canadian government, everyone had a Blackberry for years after the, it was basically old tech and no one wanted it. But, like, you will keep your Blackberries because this is a Canadian. Um, so, yeah, no, Blackberry was, it was just, they had the right, you know, mechanical keyboard and text app at the time, you know, that was really useful to people. But, but you know, just, I, I think it's super interesting that ad just to see. You know, how many ideas are still, you know, how many functions are still with us, but better executed in our current phones, you know? Oh, which, yeah, so they're not huge and weighty. Legacy? Oh, I forget. When was this, um, when did this launch again? I think it's 96. Wow. I think. Yeah. Oh, wow. We could look it up. I might be totally wrong there. I remember so, uh, no. my boss was, what, 2000 at least? I remember I had a Palm Pilot, and that was, like, through Sprint. At the time, yeah. Uh huh. So it was it was connected. Yeah. Uh, shipped first devices in '93. So there you go. Yeah. Wow. I'm glad I checked. And at that time, like Steve Jobs was forced out of Apple. Yeah, right. It was. And when he came John back Scully. and he got John Ives, the designer, they like copied Peter Rom's designs and made all the iPod and the calculator and all that stuff. Oh, well, I'm okay. And it was like all about like the fun. 
function for and all that stuff. Dieter, Dieter, what's... Dieter Roms, he's a yeah. German. He oh did all the bronze reason. stuff. Like, he made audio oh, equipment, right. shavers. Okay. Oh, stuff. Yeah. interesting. That's yeah. why... I actually have, like, a Braun Rector player from his one in the 60s. It's old school. Oh, how cool. But, like, all Apple, like, took all his designs and... That, like the iPod is so, so he is he is literally like he was the designer and for Braun that's, yeah. oh, for Braun in the 60s and so his name is Dieter Rams R-A-M-S R-A-M-S yeah interesting and so if you look at the iPod the original iPod it looks like a handheld radio that he designed interesting like exactly like it. the okay. calculator that's in the Apple phone is based on a calculator that he designed oh man no idea. Also, yeah, you can yeah. Google it later. But yeah, later, yeah. And once they did that, then like their market share jumped. And, like cause Steve Jobs was like a visionary. And he, the two of those guys, John Ives and and uh, Steve Jobs, like recognized that like people want to like a beautiful, a well designed, a beautiful design yeah. device as well yeah. as all these functions. Right. Which you know, I mean that that definitely uh, suggests a difference. Even, I mean, look at that old iMac. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, whoops. <laughs> but compared to computers at the time, like, yeah. that was the first It was thing definitely was different. Like, yeah. Is that right? That was one of and their it was designs. All too. in yeah. one. It was, you didn't need a tower. Yeah. It was convenient. Yeah. True. Yeah. Mike? Uh, nothing? Okay. Cool. Well, it's just, you know, an interesting kind of precursor to what we. Um, to what we have now in our pockets in a much more compact and efficient form, but some of the ideas were still, you know, <clears throat> they're still on their way. And just, I don't have a stylus in mind yet, but it would be great if I could scribble on it and it would figure out what I'm writing, definitely. Um, yeah. What more do we need to go through here? Oh, iMac still go for like a hundred dollars on eBay. Is that right? Yeah. As collectibles, kind of. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just want to, you know, honestly, I don't know what to. I'm kind of at a loss here as to what we should focus on, which is a bad sign. Um, so, I'm wondering if we shouldn't use our last. Uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes to go to a Kahoot on what we learned last week, which as I said, I promised we would actually do it. Makes more sense than stumbling around in this and then I'll catch up on this later. Um, so uh, let's go to that. Ultimately more useful for exams and stuff. Hmm. All right, so chapter five. Where do I get to opt out of this? Uh, or am I just logged in and that's it? much we remember and how much we were actually able to get through. Too much delay. Well, I was ahead of you guys. Really? Yeah, like a question ahead every time, and like, huh. can't do it. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Thanks for telling me. I've always, I've always thought if you were at home, by the time you answered, we'd be on to the next. But yeah, it was weird. All right. Thanks for logging in, guys. And the pin is up there if you're still on your way in. Any questions? So let's see here. 
Who's the father of the internet? All right. So this is not the father of the World Wide Web, but Tim Berners-Lee or Vint Cerf? Okay. Whoops. Somebody slipped. So it's it's it Vint Cerf. Remember who was? Remember, this was last week, it's like an era ago, but Vince Cerf, who was part of the uh, group that created TCP, uh, Transmission Communication Protocol, so basically uh, letting computers talk to one another, and then they added to that afterwards IP, Internet Protocol, so Vince Cerf. The Internet is a packet switch network. True or false? Okay. So yeah, everybody got it. It is a packet switch network. Which, what that means is it's more efficient if you're taking communications, if you split it into packets and then send it through the network, it can find whatever the most efficient route is from moment to moment. And this is happening with your videos from Netflix just as much as email or anything else. It's chunked up into packets and then each packet is addressed in the network and it gets assembled at the final destination. Even your web pages are you know, composed of packets of information pulled from servers all over the place. And so it makes a lot of sense. And in terms of mobile technology, Splitting up uh, voice communication into packets also works because when there's, you know, uh, one person's talking, the channel in the other direction is empty. When there's a pause, uh, you, you know, nobody's talking. All of those silences can be filled up with packets from other conversations. So it's not like the old technology where you tied up a whole channel with a phone call. All right, some kind of viewing is when we use the net out of habit without a clear goal. So it's either instrumental or ritualistic. That's correct as well. Everybody did great on that. So it's a ritual. You sit down every night after dinner and check the newspaper, which leads you into like uh, surfing like mad everywhere, um, versus, oh, I've got to find a, something for my assignment, which would be instrumental. Online data is limitless, but speed is controlled by? <laughs> wow, you guys are great. Bandwidth, right? Uh, we couldn't get audio and video on the internet until we got broadband, because data could travel fast enough to make that possible. What type of app helps you surf the web? Browser is excellent. All right. Who remembers what the original browser was called? Netscape. Netscape grew out of? Oh. Mosaic, yeah. So browser, Mosaic to Netscape, and that went to Firefox eventually. Um, yeah. So that's your app the browser. Awesome. How much do webcasters, non-subscription transmission pay in royalty fees? Ooh, 10% of overall annual revenue or 0.0018 cents per performance? Okay, yeah, only, only one person got, so this would be true of terrestrial radio stations. Yes, that was me. Yeah, I that's the, what they did. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you don't need to confess, Chris. No, no, it was, it's all, it's all was a secret. <laughs> that was wrong. <laughs> I confess about my crappy exam questions. I didn't know the answer. Do five hell I'll admit my, my exam question sucked, you know, so we're all, uh. it's a self-critique. So 10% of annual, uh, that's what a radio station right. pays, right? Versus if you're streaming, it seems like you don't pay much, but that's per every stream you stream in a month. So it adds up. Yeah. Um, so uh, old, old school broadcasting was a simpler time, uh, which is why I know how to talk about it. And I'm challenged by the new reality. Streaming technology leaves users with a file they can share on their computer or pushes a continuous flow of data through the net. What would that, which one is true? Okay, five people got it. So this, I should 
just add for a sec, is the comparison between podcasts, uh, which are uh, a subscription technology. You use RSS, a type of subscription, and a file gets downloaded to your device. This is in, you know, uh, technically what we call podcasts uh, versus streaming like YouTube, which, as you know, you need a live internet connection in order for it to work. So a lot of people, uh, you know, our phones are so good now, you don't even really notice it when you, and, and in addition to that, um, your phone doesn't necessarily have to have downloaded a podcast in order to play it, right? You may get like a little cloud sign beside the podcast, which means that it never even got downloaded to your phone. Uh, but in the old school of iPods and the way, you know, this was originally worked out, uh, the file would download at some moment and you would actually have it on your device. And so if you weren't connected to the internet, it would still play for you. The downside is that your device actually has the file on it and you could share it and pirate it. Um, next up, short episodes on YouTube uh, are called webisodes. That's a tough one. All right, everybody got that, right? I don't mean to make light of these in questions, but uh, so YouTube is a great example of streaming where, you know, you cannot download the YouTube file through the app. You need to have a helper and obviously they don't really like that. They want you connected and looking at their ads. The web is great for news because multiple answers are possible. Uh, there are multimedia presentation of stories, instant update of breaking news, totally reliable information, limitless space on news websites. <laughs> okay, so I think this is a crappy question. The only one here I think is false is totally reliable information. <laughs> so, okay. Multimedia presentation of stories. Yeah, everything else. I think is an advantage to, to news, um, but um, uh, yeah, totally reliable information, clearly a problem to us. Okay, well, there you go. I think you guys are gonna do well. What a hoot, congratulations. And uh, I think you guys will do well in the questions, the exam questions on, on this one, this chapter. All right, so next up, we meet in the library at the checkout desk, uh, same time as usual for our class. And if you're a little late, ask where Wendy, uh, Wendy Owens is our host. So she is going to be teaching us stuff. So I don't know if you can, if you're looking for us, we're with Wendy Owens of the library next class, okay? So good luck finishing up your essay. That's the most important thing right now. And, uh, and don't worry too much about the citation. We can fix that at the library on Friday.